I'm Will Coop. I'm the coordinator of the BC Tap Water Alliance. The Tap Water Alliance got started in February of 1997, and for the last 22 years, I've been in a position advocating the protection and reprotection of British Columbia's drinking watershed sources. Recently, uh, on March the 18th, I released a time lapse video of logging in the Peachland watershed, which is located in the Okanagan and it's got a lot of attention by the public. And on March the 22nd, uh, just recently, 2019, there was a tour inside the Peachland uh, watershed uh, celebrating World Water Day. And Global Television was there um, and got some um, video of some people asking for a moratorium of logging in the Peachland watershed. Some blame logging for the drop in water quality and say it's time to think about a moratorium. They contribute to how the water comes off the mountain, they contribute to flooding, they contribute to the degradation of our water. The mayor of Peachland, City Fortin, uh, stated that uh, a moratorium wasn't necessary because it was a seen as a lofty goal and that she said that residents should work together with forest companies to come up with some kind of collaborative scheme. I think it's really a lofty goal to think there'll ever be a moratorium. Peachland's mayor stopped short of calling for a ban on logging above her town's watershed. Not a complete moratorium but just take a look let's let's evaluate our watersheds and find out What's going on exactly? They were talking about collaboration between forestry companies. I think that's a good start. And the uh, Vernon District Forest Manager, Ray Crampton, said that uh, a moratorium wasn't necessary or couldn't be done because of locking contracts that have been let. But the forestry industry rep at today's gathering says licenses and permits to log are already in place, so a moratorium is out of the question. That said, it, we recognize uh, it has to be done in, in concert with value, um, looking after the values such as water quality and, and uh, ecosystem health. But I'm here to tell you that there already was a moratorium in place, a legal moratorium, for quite some time. So I'm going to tell you the story behind all of that. The information that I'm about to present to you on the protection history of the Peachland watershed will trouble you and knock your socks off. But it's going to take me about 20 minutes to tell you the nuts and bolts of the story. It is a small part of the vast research that I have done over the last 20 or so years on the history of BC's community watersheds. References to the reports I've written on this subject, some of which I will mention, will be linked in the description area below the YouTube for your interest. I've also included a link to a unique four-page timeline of events that were included in the book I published in 2006. Though the timeline needs to be revised and updated, there is more than enough there to help you understand the bigger picture. The book is the only document I've written that is not yet available on the internet. And remember, if you don't have enough time to read some of the text in the video as you're watching it, hit the pause button. So here's the story. There was a legal moratorium that prohibited logging in the Peachland watershed since the 1930s when government established a reserve tenure and boundary over the community watershed. Around the same time, another reserve tenure was also established for the Trapani water users and was placed over the Trapani watershed just north of the Peachland watershed. A map of the Peachland watershed was included in my 2006 book, From Wisdom to Tyranny, A History of British Columbia's Drinking Watershed Reserves. The image, which you see here, is a photograph I took from an old Forest Service map. I later included the same image in my sequel 2013 report called The Big Eddy. The reserve was created in 1930 by the Lands Department for the public interests of the Peachland Irrigation District trustees. On that map, showing the Peachland Watershed Reserve, the Forest Service wrote, no timber sales. The warning, as you will see later, was a standard notification for such reserves designed to catch the attention of government resource planning administrators. What is a community watershed reserve? It is a legislative legal provision enabled by way of the Provincial Land Act that protects or reserves
defined boundaries of public or crown lands from resource use permitting for a temporary or perpetual period of time. The Land Act is the same powerful legislation that allows government to protect crown forest lands for the creation of provincial parks, for ecological reserves, for recreation reserves, and many other purposes. Referred to either as a map reserve or an order and council reserve, a community watershed reserve is a legal tenure defined under the Land Act for the public interest that trumps any other commercial resource use or permitting dispositions such as commercial logging activities and range use for livestock. The Community Watershed Reserve tenure documents, later prepared by qualified lands ministry staff in the 1970s, all designate an expiry date of the year 9,999 for community watershed map reserves, a perpetual term of pr protection. These reserves that protected drinking watershed sources were simply once called watershed reserves. In the late 1970s, British Columbia administrators renamed them as community watershed reserves. Watershed reserves were first introduced as a public interest legislative tool by federal and provincial governments in North America, both in Canada and in the United States. The first such reserve was established by the United States federal government in 1892 to protect Portland City, Oregon's watershed, the Bull Run, from human trespass, livestock grazing, and logging. Without getting into the details, the United States Forest Service hatched a seven-point conspiratorial written plan in 1952 in order to log the watershed, which began in 1958. In 1976, Oregon Supreme Court Justice Burns found the U.S. Forest Service guilty of breaking federal law. Here in Canada, the federal government protected community drinking watersheds in the former railway belt, federal lands within the province of British Columbia. The first such protection occurred in 1904 for the Coquitlam watershed, just east of Vancouver, later ratified under a more permanent federal law in 1910. The 1910 law protecting the Coquitlam watershed was very strict, wherein even shrubs could not be removed, and people could be fined and even face jail sentences for disobeying this law. Other community watersheds protected by the federal government were over Revelstoke cities and Salmon Arms drinking water sources. The first community watershed forest protected by the British Columbia government under provisions of the Land Act occurred in 1905 for the remaining Crown lands in the Capilina watershed and in 1906 for the Seymour watershed, the water sources for Vancouver and neighboring municipalities. These protections occurred well before the creation of parks in BC the first of which was established in 1912 for Strathcona Park on Vancouver Island. In 1908, the British Columbia government introduced legislation to protect community watersheds for 999 years by way of a Crown Land Act lease, the legislation adopted by the Greater Vancouver Water District in 1927. HCS Colette the chairman of the Committee of Forest Resources, representing 14 Okanagan Irrigation Districts, which included the Peachland Irrigation District, wrote a letter on October 12, 1944, to the Sloan Forest Resources Commission. It included the following complaint. Quote, At a special meeting of the Association of British Columbia Irrigation Districts, held to discuss forest policies, concern was expressed at the extent to which rights have been get granted on irrigation watersheds for the cutting of timber. These watersheds were formally protected by forest reserves, and it came as a surprise to most of the delegates to learn that these reserves had been lifted without any consultation with the districts concerned. The association is unanimous in asking that such reserves be restored and that no further timber be cut on irrigation watersheds without the full knowledge and consent of the irrigation districts concerned, and under such regulation as they may deem necessary to assure that no damage will result either to watersheds or reservoirs. As a result of serious questions raised during the hearings held in 1944 by Okanagan water purveyors and stewards about logging trespass incidences within protected watershed reserves, the Sloan Forest Resources Commission subpoenaed 
the Nelson Regional Forest District to submit a list of all of its community watershed reserve tenures. The Nelson Forest Region sent the Commission a list of 14 departmental reserves for watershed protection, but failed to include at least one or two others, such as the one shown here, the Arrow Creek Reserve, established in 1942 for the Erickson Improvement District and for the town of Creston. Old Forest Atlas maps of the Nelson Forest Region all show the same no timber sales warnings over community watershed reserves. Not long after, in 1954, the provincial government established two more community watershed reserve tenures located within the Okanagan Lake Basin over Penticton and Ellis Creek watersheds. In 1946, when the Kamloops Forest Region issued a logging permit proposal to the City of Revelstoke inside of its Greeley Creek watershed, City Council and its health officer rebuked the forest administrator, Mr. Parlow. In a telegram, the district forest manager apologized for the logging proposal and acknowledged that the city had a legitimate watershed reserve. In the 1960s, top administrative professional foresters in government became increasingly impatient, not only with BC's water purveyors, but with other resource ministry administrators and with health ministry officials who defended community watershed reserves and government's single-use policy for remaining community watersheds. In an evolving internal power struggle, government foresters began ordering the invasion of community watersheds that were protected both as reserves and those under the decades-old single-use directive. In 1963, when Rossland City Council opposed logging proposals in their three watersheds, that had been protected in 1942 under Land Act Reserve legislation, BC Chief Forester F.S. McKinnon derided government legislation in correspondence referring to these tenures as so-called reserves. He then ordered his regional forester staff to follow his lead to disregard the law and permit logging and road access plans within these and other community watershed reserves. On September 18, 1969, the Association of BC Irrigation Districts wrote a serious letter to Lands, Forests and Water Resources Minister Ray Williston, complaining about timber sales being issued in the watershed reserves in the Okanagan. The minister replied on October 2, 1969, quote, Watershed reserves noted on legal survey maps are recorded on the status report for any timber sale application. A special not notation is made on the clearance that is sent to the district office concern, drawing their attention to the reserve. We are quite sure that this procedure is being followed in the majority of cases, but in the view of complaints received by your association, the district offices are being reminded of the established procedures and the necessity for consulting with the water resource engineers and our municipal or irrigation district authorities. So community watersheds were established to keep logging out, but the Forest Service failed to uphold this restriction by various means of trickery. Because of the contemptuous and brazen actions that were directed by top Forest Service administrators in the 1960s, water purveyors and the public registered written complaints with the social credit government about the impacts of logging on their water sources. The complaints escalated over a period of six or so years, so much so that by early 1972, they caused government to finally order the Environment and Land Use Technical Committee of Deputy Ministers to establish a provincial task force on community watersheds, the first government investigation on this subject in North America. Under the authority of the Deputy Ministers Committee, the task force began establishing and ordering the creation and recreation of community watershed reserves, almost 300 in number. In one of these group orders, the Director of Lands sent a memo on March 18, 1974 to the Forest Service for that department to map register 25 community watershed reserves in the Okanagan area located in the Vernon, Fairview and Princeton water districts. The order included the Peachland Watershed Reserve. On July 9, 1973, the Director of Lands requested the Lands Officer in charge of Provincial Reserves to formally register these watershed reserves within the Crown Land Registry. 
The 300 or so watershed reserves were listed at a 1980 Ministry of Environment final document which also included a series of five large format maps showing the reserve locations along with detailed information and tables. The document, called Guidelines for Watershed Management of Crown Lands Used as Community Water Supplies, was sent to all of BC's regional districts and to affected water purveyors to whom government granted these reserves. Documents show that during the 1980s, Peachland Irrigation District trustees kept watch over the protection of forest stands within the Peachland Watershed Reserve. In numerous correspondence documents with the Penticton Forest District, the Irrigation District repeatedly made reference to their watershed reserve tenures, not only mentioning the reserve over the Peachland Watershed, but also the reserve over the neighboring Trapani Community Watershed. In 1988, the Peachland Irrigation District and its Board of Trustees was disbanded when it amalgamated with the District of Peachland. As was the case with many other irrigation districts and improvement districts amalgamations, municipal politicians were not as guarded over the protection of drinking water sources as former irrigation and improvement district trustee administrators were. And shortly after 1988, the Ministry of Forests unlawfully granted a forest tenure to Riverside Forest Products in the Peachland Watershed Reserve. And we're still trying to find out when this forest tenure was created. Unknown to and hidden from the public for quite some time, the Chief Forester had wrongfully included watershed reserve tenures in allowable annual cut determinations within timber supply areas since the early 1980s, even though inter-ministry comprehensive planning reports on BC's forests that were presented to the BC legislature beginning in 1980, these are referred to the Forest Resource and Range Analysis Technical Reports, stated that such reserves were off limits to forest planning. Here's a quote from the 1980 report under a title called Protection of Watersheds. In the management of forests and rangelands, the Ministry of Forests should be fully aware of the constraints set out for community watersheds. These areas have all been defined and placed on forest records as map reserves. And here's a quote from the 1984 report. An estimate of the anticipated withdrawals from the land base over the next 20 years for such purposes of farmlands, watershed reserves, wildlife preserves, ecological reserves, and recreational reserves. So to help you understand what I'm talking about, in February 1992, the Ministry of Forests published the Timber Harvesting Guidelines for the Okanagan Timber Supply Area, or TSA. In the report was a map showing the boundaries of the Okanagan TSA, which is divided into three forest districts the Salmon Arm Forest District, the Vernon Forest District, and the Penticton Forest District. The Timber Harvesting Guidelines document included three maps showing the locations of all community watersheds in each forest district. Almost all these community watersheds were watershed reserves. Now all seemingly and unlawfully under the Ministry of Forest criteria of integrated resource management, and all mysteriously included in the allowable annual cut. But here's the big clue. The 1992 Timber Harvesting Guidelines report states the following, quote, the, These guidelines supersede guidelines for watershed management of crown lands used as community water supplies, 1980. The 1980 guidelines report referred to in the 1992 document is the report published by the Provincial Task Force on Community Watersheds, and all the community watersheds identified in that document were watershed reserves. So let me show you the comparison between the map locations of the community watershed reserves as provided in the 1980 document and from those in the 1992 Okanagan Timber Harvesting Guidelines document. For the Penticton Forest District, the map on the left shows the watershed reserve locations from 1980 and the one on the right from 1992. For the Vernon Forest District, the map on the left shows the 1980 watershed reserves and the map on the right, the 1992 map. For the Salmon Arm Forest District, 
The map on the left shows the watershed reserves for 1980 and the one on the right for 1992. After the Forest Resources Commission concluded its public hearings in 1991 on the state of BC's forest resources, government initiated numerous land use public planning processes throughout BC for the remainder of the 1990s under the guidance of the Commission on Resources of Environment, CORE, and the Land Use Coordination Office, LUCO. These processes generated the completion of four regional land use plans and 17 land and resource management plans called LRMPs. The Okanagan Shushwap LRMP was held over a five year period from 1996 to 2000. In this intensive planning process, as in all the other land use plans, CORE and LUCO were required to provide all Crown land tenure documentation and tenure type maps for public and stakeholder representatives who participated on various resource committee tables so that the tables could determine and decide what resources were to be protected and which ones were to fall under new resource management criteria. I later discovered in 2005, when researching all the land use plan and LRMP reports and interviewing government staff involved in the planning processes, that CORE and LUCO withheld documents, computer printout spreadsheets, written descriptions and explanations from the public about the community watershed reserve tenures in each land use planning process, including those in the planning boundaries of the Okanagan Shushwap LRMP. By way of this fraud, it's obvious why watershed reserve tenure information was being withheld, so that the overall land base could be proposed and freed up to allow resource use permitting for logging, cattle grazing, commercial recreation and the like within otherwise restricted zones. I later wrote in my 2006 book and in the 2013 sequel, Big Eddie Report, that because government withheld information about watershed reserves from the public land use planning processes, these processes that omitted these tenures should be considered deficient and illegal and similarly for the resulting forest tenures and licenses granted in watershed reserves. Government's approval of the Okanagan Shushwap LRMP set up new criteria for logging in community watersheds, whether these watersheds had or had not been established as watershed reserves. This was also the case for the Peachland Community Watershed. In forest stewardship planning documents, and in forest sustainability reports, all forest licensees who have tenures in community watersheds in the Okanagan timber supply area make conditional references to the Okanagan Shushwap land resource management plan's legal objectives. These objectives were later impacted by the callous, not unduly legislation introduced by the BC Liberal Administration, which allowed forest licensees to log more and more of the forests in community watersheds. The logging in community watersheds occurred with little to no oversight by government. The professional reliance legislation that was introduced in 2004 following further prevented the public from direct or meaningful involvement in scrutinizing forest planning in community watersheds. Following upon the Okanagan LRMP's failure to identify the community watershed reserve tenures, all the forest licensees who are unlawfully granted forest tenures and permits by the government within these reserves, including the operations of BC timber sales, they only make reference to the reserve's land status as community watersheds. As in so many other government reports, all this reserve history was locked up in an old chest and buried somewhere deep underground. So, now you know the story why there was a legal moratorium before and what happened um, during the land and resource management plan of the Okanagan Shushwap. So here's where the public, here's where you come in. You can help us to bring attention to this issue. Recently, in early March, we sent a letter to the Premier and top cabinet resource ministers asking for an inquiry into why watershed reserves, legal tenures, 
were ignored during land use planning processes in the 1990s. So you can help by writing letters to the Premier asking for such an inquiry. Back in 2006 when we released our, re our book, From Wisdom to Tyranny, A History of British Columbia's Drinking Watershed Reserves, in a media release we called this a crime of the century, which it really is. So please help us to promote this issue. Help protect and reprotect British Columbia's drinking watershed sources.